Hello. My name is Juus Kalimäki. I'm the head of department at the economics department at Aalto University School of Business. It's my great pleasure to, um, to invite you all to this special occasion that Bengt Holmström has kindly agreed to um, give here. So the original title was Understanding Incentives, Contracts and Beyond, and as you can see, we have moved a little bit beyond that. We are now um, going to uh, hear a lecture about uh, Beyond Pay for Performance. So before that, let me, uh, let me just take this opportunity to, to introduce Bengt in a few words. Uh, I understand that, that you did not come here to listen to me, so I, I try to be brief. So Bengt has a, has a long connection to Finland. Obviously, he's, he's uh, as Finnish as, um, as you can imagine a person to be. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Helsinki in mathematics and physics in 1972. After that, he moved on to his graduate studies at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, where he completed his PhD under the supervision of uh, Bob Wilson in 1978. After that, Bengt spent a year at Hanken, another year at Core Louvain in Belgium, and after that, moved on with his career in the United States. His first academic position there was at uh, Kellogg, School of Bis uh, Kellogg School of Management at uh, Northwestern University, and after that, uh, he continued at Yale University, and since 1994, Bengt has been at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Bengt has received pretty much all the honors that uh, any academic economist can achieve. As, uh, as, as you can imagine, whenever somebody achieves Nobel Prize in economics, that's uh, a, as, uh, as high an achievement as possible at all in academic world. Uh, beyond that, Bengt is uh, an honorary doctor at many universities and has received many other significant prizes. They're too numerous to, um, for me to, to read a list over here. You all probably know also that Bengt has been a member of the board of Aalto University since the university began in 2010. Bengt has served on, on um, boards at various Finnish companies and he has participated actively in economic debate in Finland. What you may not know so much is the contribution of that, that Bengt Holmström has had to academic economics in Finland and I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about that a bit. For the last 15 years, Uri Jansson Foundation has had a postdoctoral fellowship agreement with MIT and Bengt was uh, instrumental in getting that off the ground. So this is an opportunity for Finnish junior economists to spend a year at MIT. So my colleagues basically get to go spend a year with Bengt and Bengt's colleagues at MIT. For a junior academic, this is an opportunity that is priceless. You can't get any better start for, for sort of developing your uh, academic professional networks than staying a year at Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is not an easy thing for any university to, uh, to accomplish because all universities on the planet would like to send their junior people to MIT and Harvard. So we are very, very uh, lucky in Finland to have this opportunity uh, to, to send our best people to spend a year at MIT. When I look at the corridor in my own department, I, I was just enumerating the people who have taken advantage of this opportunity, and I realized that I must be one of the old guard, because I am pretty much the only one of the uh, 50 and under people there who has not spent a year at MIT under this contract. So, so the impact of this particular arrangement, which I credit to a large extent to Bengt, has been enormously important for economics, academic economics in Finland. So whenever I'm asked to evaluate what is the really significant uh, impact, uh, impact that Bengt has had on us as acad uh, uh, academic economists, this is what comes to my mind the first. Over the years, I've had a number of occasions to talk to to Bengt about economic theory, about departmental matters, and so forth. Marco Tervi, who is going to be taking que uh, presenting questions after the lecture uh, that, that Bengt has delivered, so questions that, that have come from you, the audience, in advance. Marco has been a student of Bengt at MIT, 
and Bengt has been a role model to all economists in Finland. So it is an enormous pleasure for me to give the floor to Bengt Holmström. Uh, thank you, Jose, for that kind in introduction. I've known Jose for a long time. He is, of course, uh, he is one of the stars, stars in economics, not just in Finland, but in the world. Uh, it's really heartening to hear that, uh, that uh, you think that I have had some impact on, on, I would say, the considerable success of uh, Finnish economists in general. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, colleagues and friends, and, and uh, on relatively short notice. Uh, <coughs> and thank you for subjecting yourself to, to a sort of a trial run. I had to give a Nobel lecture in Sweden on the 8th, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is why the title changed a little bit, and this is uh, uh, the lecture roughly. This is my first try on it, and, and uh, the challenge is to, to be uh, somehow capturing something essential about the way I think about economics, uh, stay away from making it sound totally trivial, which is always a challenge for economics, especially among Nobel Prize uh, uh, winners. You know, economists, when people understand us, they think it's trivial, and when they don't understand us, then uh, that's not good either. Uh, but uh, but uh, all the other sciences get away with not being understood, and and nobody ever thinks they are trivial. But in, but for economists, this is uh, this is a challenge. So uh, <clears throat> let me say just one more word about uh, about myself as an introduction. Is is uh, I'm often asked well, how did I get interested in incentives and so on and. And the normal route would be obviously that one goes and, and uh, gives a, gives a, a lecture, uh, uh, I'm sorry, goes to a PhD program and then in the PhD program one learns about, uh, about the, in, the interests, the current interests and, and chooses something from that. My trajectory is very different in that I went, uh, I went to work, I, I'm a mathematician or applied mathematician, operations researcher. I went to work at, uh, at Alström, which, uh, uh, which my, my advisor, Olli Locke, arranged for me. And, uh, and I went there actually to continue work that Marco Callio had been starting at Alström, namely building a big, uh, complicated linear program. I don't remember, maybe Marco remembers, but I think it had over a thousand equations, a uh, th thousand variables. And, equations in the hundreds, five-year planning model. Uh, it was very popular in those days, in the early 70s, to, uh, to co companies were getting used to uh, or introduced to, uh, to IT, and uh, it was popular for them to start uh, with uh, uh, exploiting it by thinking that it will be very useful to have these kind of planning models. And I, uh, I that's where, as I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, starting to collect data in the factories and, and, and going around, and, uh, and uh, some of it was useful for them, but it was clear that they were very, A, nervous about the model. You know, they were, I came with some black box before them, and they had to give data, and then <laughs> they realized it's going to have an impact on their lives but they, didn't, they weren't sure about it. One thing they did understand is that they better exaggerate you know, some of the projects that they wanted money for. And so pretty quickly it became clear to me that this wasn't really going to work the way one might think it works. That is, uh, there were huge incentive, what we now would construe as incentive problems, not because they were devious, I should emphasize, but because they were convinced that the headquarters did not understand what was important. You know, the headquarters were building these models and, and the incentive problem, the way we construe it, usually headquarters doesn't, you know, isn't sure about the motives and incentives of the people uh, underneath them, but the causality or the relationship is actually also reverse. So that has never been actually studied. So that's one of the things that somebody might be interested in, where, where the, the, the subordinates think the headquarters is no good. Uh, and and how, how do you behave under circumstances like that? 
So that's where I got interested in it. I went to Stanford. I was uh, on a Asla Fulbright uh, cultural grant. I was on leave from Malmstrom after two years. And uh, I was just lucky because it turned out that when I went to Stanford, incentives happened to be a topic that started to be interesting. And, uh, and that's a fairly rare occasion where you know you have encountered something in practice, you kind of are really interested, that's what I spent time on at Alstom, thinking about that problem, what kind of solutions, and then I walk into actually really the place, the number one place of thinking about incentives in economics. So I never even dreamed about, about or thought about becoming an economist, but I was drawn into this problem and, and, and switched over from what you might think operations research into, into economics. So the reason I'm telling this story is, is not just about the serendipity, but, but that this has really, to this day, it still influences my thinking these two years at Alstrom. So it tells something to young people about the importance of your first job and having a mentor of the sort I had at Alstrom. Fa fabulous, fabulous person, uh, chief financial officer, absolutely the best teacher you can ever have about how a firm functions and how such a person thinks about firms. So it, it, it has paid dividends these two years at Alstrom, you know, throughout my career and maybe sets me a little bit apart and gave me a leg up on, on other people because I have a very strong sense of relevance even though I am a theorist. So I wanted to talk about the, for I, the other side is I wanted to give you some sense of the progression of thought. I have been writing articles, actually not that many, but some of them I think have had influence, perhaps because of the awesome experience. And, uh, but also for a particular way of thinking. That, uh, that, and I wanted to kind of somehow communicate what has happened during these 30 years or 35 years that I worked on. So I'm, I'm going to start from a very simple model that was the going model, so to speak, when I entered the field. I call it an effort model for reasons you'll understand. But it is about motivation. I'm going to talk about the my contribution to that model, which was uh, what's known as the informativeness principle. And then I'm going to explain that that simple model, though simple, it was the simplest model you can think of. And I'm going to put it up so you see it has sort of three, three moving parts. Uh, and, 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 and we thought how erroneous it was to think that, that, that it was a simple model. It's actually the maximally complicated model. And in, and then I will talk about the fact that the mistake is to think that the agent can only handle one task, such as putting out effort. And that was thought to be simple. It turned out to cause us a lot of headaches for, for a good 10 years or more. Some work on it still today. And instead shift, this was a big shift in mindset to go and look at Multitasking, as we call it, that is when agents do several things. It simplifies the solution, it makes it much more relevant, and it has been really, I think, the big, the, the, the big ticket in this, uh, in this, at least in the field I have been working. It was a big mindset changer for me. And, uh, and so we'll see it, and one of the reasons that's the case is because it actually has led to think about many instruments, which is really, I think, at the front line right now. You know, this pay for performance is not the action. Incentives is about 10% pay for performance or less, and 90% about other incentives. And so this is a lecture about incentive contracting, where actually pay for performance, where we started, has, uh, has uh, taken over time a secondary role. So that's. Uh, uh, let me, so let me start with the principal agent problem. I have to set up a model just, just so that I remember it. Uh, but the context, it's a generic, principal agent stands for a generic situation that, uh, that you can see repeatedly. Uh, employer, employee, where employer is a principal, employee is an agent, client, lawyer, you hire a client to work for you, uh, the client is an agent, and, and I'm sorry, the, uh, the client is the principal, the lawyer is the agent, 
board and CEO is a very topical uh, discussion. Uh, constantly hear about CEO, executive pay being excessive and so on. That's a similar relationship and so on and so forth. It could be your surgeon and you, it, it's a salesman and, and so on. It's, it's, it's really the generic, uh, uh, generic uh, agency problem that uh, we are talking about here. And it has two problems. It's that uh, interest and preferences are not aligned. So that's the main, main sort of task of the contract to do, is how do you design contracts so that interests that in principle are apart get aligned through the contract in some manner. Not perfectly, but the best you can do in the circumstances. And what makes the contracting difficult is that performance, what I see an agent do if I'm a principal is actually is a, in, an imperfect um, measure of what the agent did. And so, as I said, the instrument we are first going to look at is the, the pay for, uh, some kind of pay for, pay for performance contract. And, and uh, I'll come to the main trade-off trade -off in, in just a, uh, a second, but it is about it's stronger incentives, but the cost side is going to be that the agent is ha bearing risk because the measure is imperfect. And uh, the thing is, the principal, you might think, well, the principal says that's the agent's problem. That's not just the agent's problem because the principal ultimately has to compensate the agent for taking on that additional risk. Uh, so here is the only technical slide, really, is, uh, or maybe there's one more, but, uh, but Morley's had, I don't tell you the antecedents Wilson had done work, there's, there's a long history of, you know, how people had tried to think about these contracting problems. And you should understand that there were a lot of different approaches to it in some ways, and people didn't realize that they were working on the same problem. Some way, people thought about risk sharing, some were thinking about insurance, some think, thought about other contexts. So, Morley's was one of the people who sort of brought it under one umbrella and, and simplified it into what I call this effort model. There is a benefit for the principle, which is this B as a function of what the agent chooses, the action E, and then there's a cost function for the agent, which is uh, the agent doesn't like, say, more E, that's why I'm calling it cost here, and it's CE. And the question is, how do you align this? One likes e, more E, the other one doesn't like more E. Uh, how do you, uh, how, where do we end up through a contract? How do we pay the agent so that the patient will put out some effort at least? And the, as I said, measured performance in the simplest case is just it's some, some signal X that is the agent effort with a noise term. So you don't see it exactly, but you see it, it with noise. And then the contract is, uh, as I've written it, is then a function of x. So I, I have to somehow use this s of x, which is an imperfect, generally an imperfect uh, performance-based measure uh, contract <coughs> in order to induce the agent to work. And I just put down the timing. You contract, the agent chooses e, x is realized, and then you pay the agent uh, S of X. We call it a one period model. So there is the notion of first best. The first best is important always to understand meaning. What if we have ideal circumstances? And so first best cases here are, are agent's choice of, of E is uh, verifiable. That is actually we do observe E. So epsilon has no noise at all. Then we just say that, you know, do E and whatever E uh, is efficient, which is maximizing this BE minus CE, that's the total surplus, that's the benefit minus cost, and then, uh, then you do that. There's another case which is efficient, which is uh, or where you have no loss, is that the agent is risk neutral, so then you just sell the thing to the agent. So the agent actually pays the principal a fixed amount and then takes on the full responsibility. Taxi drivers are on this kind of scheme for a reason that it's very hard to verify what exactly they are doing, so they become what we call residual claimants. They, they pay a rent, and then they are on their own. 
And then we have an interesting and important case, moving support. It's important because Finland is using this scheme. Moving support means that the agent can do something and completely avoid, you know, do, at le do say, the agreed amount of effort. And if the agent does so, then there will be no, the X will never be such as to, uh, as to cause a penalty for the agent. So for, for, for you are Finns, so, so the speeding tickets in Finland are like that. You know, you, you are paying the day fines, as, we know, as, as they are called in English, and, and, and they can go up to 150,000 is the, the maximum. By the way, they always make the New York Times. That is, is the one time Finland appears in the US is when Finland is again given another $150,000 ticket to some, some, you know, somebody who drove 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. The point is that you can, the idea is that that's okay, because he didn't have to or she didn't have to drive over the limit. And since you can avoid entirely by following rigorously the speed limits, you will never be punished. You could be punished a million dollars, and there's no loss. Except for the fact, of course, and this is relevant to this error term, you may start daydreaming, you don't notice all the signs and so on, and eventually you accidentally end up driving too fast. That happens to me a lot. I assume it happens to you a lot. Is 150,000 reasonable is a good question. And I don't, this is part of it, sort of one way to think about this problem is, you know, you're trying to do your best and then still something bad happens. Okay, so, uh, so I, I didn't uh, say it, but you see the R times v, the BE minus CE is, uh, is the benefit minus the cost, and then the objective also includes the cost of the variance, this bar S is the variance induced by the incentive scheme. And R is some kind of uh, weight on how much the agent dislikes this riskiness. So informativeness principle, what's that? Well, instead of asking what is the optimal incentive scheme, you can ask a simpler, seemingly simpler question first. What kind of information is valuable for this problem? Suppose it's X, but then something else that I call here Y. And Steve Savell and I uh, independently came upon uh, this result that saying that actually everything is valuable that bears on information whether the agent behaved or not. This was, by the way, not believed to be true. People felt that if it's very noisy, you get very noisy information, at some point it's just not going to be valuable and you are not going to be weight on it. It turns out that logic is wrong. Any information that is relevant, that is valuable, no matter how noisy, in some sense, is actually going to be included. And then again, if it's information that's not valuable, it will always be adverse, it, be, it will be a bad thing to include. So this is an if and only if statement, as we say in, in our language. The other thing of the informativeness principle is, and this is something I emphasize quite a bit, is that it is, remember, the principal and agent choose an, a, 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 an incentive scheme in advance, and in this model, then, the principal will already know what the agent is going to do. So when the game goes to the stage of the agent actually does something, and then you get the outcome, at that stage, all, everything is forecastable about the agent's action. And then the rest, it's just noise that causes, you know, it's the accident that causes, uh, causes the payment to vary. Despite this, the S of X is actually chosen in advance as if you made inferences exposed. And the reason this is so, this is a well-known understanding in statistics. People who have statistics, they understand very well what it means to see a signal, make inferences about it, about, say, where does this signal come from? In this case, what effort did the agent make? And it is this inference thing that makes it one understand exactly how this model thinks. And this is a part of, of, of I would say, I'm not the only theorist, but not every theorist does understand quite this, that it's so crucial to understand how the model thinks, and it is crucial to listen to the model. 
That is not through assumptions. So trying to understand, uh, and I can't, I won't have time to go through the Morley's example, but a lot of the oddities about this model, such as you know the incentive scheme not be monotone and things like that, which were a feature and puzzled people a lot, and cases where you know you can almost get to first best, but not exactly. So essentially, you could circumvent these problems. Everything got understood by this slide. Just as soon as you understand this is like an inference problem, you exactly knew how this model thinks. And there are some implications that are interesting. There's controllability. You know, information should be, you should use filters, you know, such as, you know, was the weather bad when you drove the taxi? That should come into the contract in principle. You use relative performance measure, you compare, you know, how good the CEO was relative to the industry, relative to other CEOs, and so on and so forth, was the macroeconomic elements, what were they, and so they should go in there. And I put in also an extra thing, this vesting idea that you should wait for additional information to come. This principle says don't close out the contract at the time you only know today's valuation. Wait till the CEOs, you know, one year, two year, three year effect on the company has, uh, has let it play out because that's additional information and that should have bearing on what you should be paid. So uh, this, last, uh, this last point actually is enormously important. I think it's actually the single most important problem with CEO compensation, which uh, you may have some questions on later on. There's a very, this model also did something very important, this informant in this present. It showed, by showing how the model thinks, you understand that it's thinking about a lot of things incorrectly. That is, this is not the right model for thinking, for instance, about what shape, should it be an option, should it be a linear contract, and so on. And that's where the multi, so it re, this was the feed into the multitasking thinking. It wasn't that we thought that uh, let's, do a, let's do a model with many tasks. You know, that's not how economists think. They, they say you go to many tasks for a reason, because the simpler problem is just one task. And if, we, if one task would have told us everything we need to know, we would have been happy. But you, you go and, and, uh, and the paradox is by making the model more complicated, I have no chance to explain it here, you get actually much simpler solutions. You get linear models, for instance. That's a paper with Milgram. You get a very versatile model with a lot of empirical implications that actually seem to match the data quite well. And it is easy to work with. And the attention now is not on how hard are you working, but how smart are you working, and are you allocating your, your things. Uh, correctly. And the challenges come from a, a tension between things that are easy to measure, like quantity, and things that are hard to measure, like quality. Similarly, routine tasks, you know, are you following some, some routine? Innovative tasks, difficult to assess because they come with a delay, the results, they may not come at all, they are very noisy. Teaching, Hard versus soft skills, so teaching arithmetics, very easy to measure. Finland is doing wonderfully on the PISA scores. On the, but are we making the mistake of the PISA scores now pushes us in the direction of just measuring, you know, can they read, can they write, can they do the arithmetics? And, and the cost is that the, you, the teacher will no longer pay attention to the, to the soft skills, as they say. Or then they teach to the, that is, they teach to the test, but there have been worse cases. They actually give the test to the students in advance. So, you know, there are countries, I won't name any countries, I'm certain that they are just cheating. You know, they are giving the test to the students, they are doing well on the PISA scores, and, and, and you know, as a result. Because the, the stakes are so big, the incentives are so strong on the things that they can be measured on, that they do all sorts of other things. Short-term versus long-term investments is another example. So the lesson from the models, and I'm not going now through the analytics, is that balancing incentives becomes really critical for the full portfolio of tasks. The stronger incentive on one activity, if you push on quality, 
it's going to take its price on quant I'm sorry, on qu quantity, which is easy to measure, it's going to take a price on quality. It's going to be all that harder to get attention on, qu uh, on, on the quality side. So they are, and similarly, uh, so the point is that, uh, that uh, there are sort of two ways to incentivize quality. One is to do better measures of quality, you know, have, you know, consumer feedback or whatever you have. But the simplest measure is don't push those easy to measure tasks. So there are two ways of getting quality. And that's a very important lesson, a very simple lesson all the time forgotten by, by people. That this is the most common sort of error in the design of incentives. You push on something that you can measure, that the party can control, and the answer is no. You don't have to do that. The controllability is not an explanation of why you should be doing it. You get to cases where no incentive is the best incentive. You just don't give any incentive on, on, on quantity, and, and that's people for reasons of pride and, and, and other things, they will provide quality or their reference groups like, pro, like uh, professional groups and others. Uh, and, and so that's, there's an other payoff on this multitasking, which is the bigger payoff actually, in the end. It is you realize you have a lot of different instruments to work on. And so you change the job design is very important. So you may want to just exclude tasks. So one way of excluding tasks is to bring, bring workers into the office. I had my first year at Northwestern, I had no windows. There was no distractions. You know, the only thing I could do is work on these uh, incentive problems and, 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 and that's actually when I was most productive in my whole career. You know, then now I have a window on the, you know, that overlooks the Charles River and there's a beautiful buildings and you know, I'm just turned the wrong way all the time and I'm looking at the sea. And of course, uh, uh, this Nobel Prize is not going to be very conducive to, for incentives either. Uh, so, uh, so one way you can do it, one thing is to just exclude the tasks. If they are important tasks, you know, and you have big balance, have somebody who controls quality separately from the guy who is operating quantity. That is, you split up the task into two people and make sure they cannot sort of collude amongst each other. Bureaucratic rules, people are whining all the time about bureaucratic rules in organizations. That's every, every year I have lived my life and that includes, by the way, my instincts at Alstrom. Let's make stronger incentives for these people. Well, guess what? The bureaucratic rules have been around for 5,000 years. The pharaohs had it, you know. That's not such a stupid idea after all. And so this model will easily explain to you why rules and rigidities and constraints such as, you know, you can't take the simplest of constraints. You can't work in two companies at the same time unless you are a, a you know, independent operator. That's just kind of taken as given that when I go to Arsenal, I don't go and at the same time work for, you know, Enzo Gutzeit or something like that. That seems so obvious. That's a massive evidence of the importance of these constraints. Google advertises 20% free time, you know, to think what they want. They could have said 80%, you can't think what you want. You think about what we want. So that's another constraint. But it was so notable, this news about 20%, that it made the headlines for years. Because in most companies, you are told what you are supposed to be working on, that's the job design part and so on. You have promotions. You have control of information flows inside firms. These are massively powerful incentives to the extent that actually pay for performance is a very rare occasion. It's been estimated that 80% or more of people are never getting any bonuses or anything like that in jobs. Because there, there is no, they either distort their incentives to do the wrong things, or, or things are already taken care of by all these other instruments. Because they are cheaper and more efficient, especially under the control of a, a firm. So firms are, in the first instance, 
institutions which take away incentives that you would have in a market as an independent contractor. I will have to skip this because of the time. Uh, but it leads to, a, we wrote a paper with Milgram that, uh, that is a little complicated, but basically the idea that one can look at the firm as an orchestrator of all these different incentive instruments. Job design, authority, promotions, monitoring, constraints, even praise and social rewards are part of the incentive system. And very importantly, a very simple part of the incentive design is to do it right from the beginning. You hire the right people that are motivated to do what you want, fit into your culture. That's as big a, a incentive design as anything else. So you see this uh, pecuniary, non-pecuniary uh, elements coming in. So let me conclude with just a few remarks. Uh, firms make limited use of pay performance. That's where we started. Multitasking is relevant, actually, whether you give praise, whether you, uh, you, you monitor people or anything you do, it doesn't matter whether, what the actual reward is that you give the agent. Multitasking is always an issue. So one thing leaders should know, and this is, this is uh, for INCO, you know, uh, it's easy to give praise. Maybe not in Finland, actually, but you know, it's, it's easy to give praise. I love you know, giving praise. Uh, I praise myself every day. Uh, the, the, it's a lot harder to be critical and constructive. This is actually every leader we tell, that's where the good are separated from the bad. How do you also give feedback that's constructive and critical? So that's, these are all sort of, in the context of multitasking, one can think about these as important considerations. And then tapping into the desire, and this is something I, I think I learned, I have mentioned sort of in passing about Alston, tapping into the desire to do well. We want to do well on the whole. This is not the theory, by the way, that starts from the premise, people don't like work, people don't like to do this, work. we have to coax them into doing that. That's a sociologist construct. You know, they want to also get into the game and they have criticized us, but we are not, that's not what it is about. It is really here, so you go into this and ask yourself, you know, people want to do well. The problem is, they may want to do so well that they start influencing you in the wrong ways, unless you challenge them. So at Alston, for instance, I found out people trying to do well often leads to you, say, being shy about things, or don't want to take risks, or something like you don't want to make mistakes. First impressions matter for young people. But they don't say, we'll see if you have any questions. You will see that it will be the old people that ask the questions because they don't care about their reputation anymore. But young people are very conscious about, you know, how they are perceived. Now, this is also something important to manage and something that I wrote about in 1982, directly, by the way, from the Alstom experience. It was just, you know, mapping the Alstom observations into what was a model and that I think has ha had quite some influence. So, we are moving to conclude the main storyline here, uh, the trajectory of this thinking is, come, is, is starting from the simple, pay for person, seemingly simple, but turns out to be the most complicated. Very difficult to do mathematically, very badly behaved models, and then going into something more complicated, more realistic, and the models start to talk in ways that uh, match the evidence reasonably way, and in a way talk that you can listen to it, you understand it. It's really actually price theory, uh, which is a very powerful theory. Uh, still, price theory with the special feature that prices are costly. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. So I'm Marko Terve, I'm a professor of economics um, here at Aalto University. So it's my pleasure to ask a few questions sent by members of the Aalto community. I don't actually have the names of those who uh, submitted these questions through online systems. Do you have the age? 
and, no, and not the age either, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, if you hear a question that's very similar to what you sent and not quite the same, that's because uh, some of these questions are actually mergers of several related questions sent by, uh, sent by people. Uh, but so let me start by uh, uh, question topical on this first day of slush season. Uh, is it possible to incentivize innovation through good contract design? Well, it is a complicated, this, this falls definitely into the category of complicated incentive designs. So remember, you know already part of the answer. You know, don't use any pay for performance incentive is one approach to this innovation. Just have, let people do if they have, so that's on the whole, by the way, what we are academics on. We don't have a bonus plan. I know that Finland has, you know, Alto has bonus plans, but we have competition. So we get eventually rewarded when we do well. You know, we can get, uh, we get into better universities and so on. So there's, there's that kind of driver. But a lot of people have just a self-motivation. They are curious, they are interested. No, for God's sake, don't go and destroy that drive. So no incentive is my first answer. Uh, uh, you can try to do things and, and, and and it's interesting, the pharmaceutical industry is struggling with this. One is to do a new job design, ship them out from the company and have small companies, you know, and that feed the big companies with ideas. Because there you are an entrepreneur, there you, it's, you can do what you want more or less, and you have, if you succeed, you can sell your idea and, and get into the pipeline of a big company. And importantly, another instrument they have used or they're choosing, you can publish. This is a big deal in pharmaceuticals. Can you publish your research or should it stay secret? And they are increasingly finding that they better let the people, these kind of people want to publish because they want to get the recognition from their professionals. That's the people they really care about. What, what does Marco think about my work? You know, I don't care about what the Nobel Prize Committee thinks about it, but what Marco thinks is really important to me. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, that's, that's uh, so do you see, these are again very much not about, you know, I imagine somebody thought about what should it look like in terms of a pay for performance contract. My answer is I'm going to, I'm going to go and look in the toolbox for something entirely different. Okay. Uh, what could the public sector learn from the private sector in contracting and incentive programs? Well, the, the pub, there are many, let me, as a backdrop, if I had gone and talked about organizational economics more, I, one, the first thing is the public sector tends to get jobs that the private sector can't handle. So this is kind of, a, they get the bad cards in the game one might say. So, do you know, the competition and all these other wonderful things couldn't handle certain things, usually having to do something with the consumer more than the producer side. The producer externalities, as we call it in economics, the effect that normally causes some kind of organizational to emerge, it, production externalities are typically pretty well handled within a company. In fact, companies are, in my view, about internalizing externalities and the first line. Consumers are very different. You know, it could be risks of consumers, it could be, of course, then public goods that consumers enjoy and so on. These are complicated. The market has not solved it. So that's very important as a backdrop. So don't go and copy into public services the incentives that you see in private companies. Please. The whole idea of the public company is to do something entirely different. They don't compete usually with people. There are certain things that can be outsourced, but it comes down to bureaucratic rules. In praise of bureaucratic rules. I, 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 I cringe every time I hear somebody saying, let's put into this our bureaucracies, you know, something, you know, strong incentives. Let's bring the private sector inside, you know, Kela or whatever it happens to me. I say, oh my God, you know, have they not read my book? <laughs> uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and so 
it's, uh, it's, uh, the answer is that, the first answer is nothing. Well, uh, on a related note that might have the same answer is, uh, what kind of incentive systems should we provide for politicians? Well, politicians, uh, well, uh, yes, uh, wonderful topic. And by the way, you will get a much longer and deeper answer than you care to listen to. Uh, you know, I give a short answer. First of all, these people are motivated often, I think, by, you know, Concern. They want to do good for society, for humankind, and so on. I mean, there are some who just want to, you know, be on TV and so on. But I, on the whole, I think they have a public service orientation. And 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 the problem, in my view, when you say, how could we, everybody is whining in Finland, in America, everywhere they are whining about how politicians have become so bad. The social scientist looks at this and, and says. Humans have not changed, you know, over the 5,000 years very much. In fact, you know, we are starting to see uh, a decline in sort of the civilization probably soon uh, in the world. And, and, uh, and uh, everywhere popping out, you know, very populist, what we call populist economics. So if I could change things, I would not give them as much airtime. But it is you people. The public who wants you to see more and more out of the, on the economy. You want to scrutinize every politician. You want to scrutinize. It's you who are driving this system in a bad direction. You know, for every little misdemeanor that you see, find a politician, you know, who used her credit card like Mona Salin in Sweden, you know, and bought 400 euro something or a Swedish krona or whatever it was, you know, and, and she had to leave her post. I mean, when you have that scrutiny and you have to be in the glass box, you are going to behave badly because you are going to pander to the public. And you don't understand how much, you know, I can't give complicated answers to anything because it, you, you, you won't listen to the context in which, why did I do this? You know, it's so long answer that you have, you know, you have already switched channel by the time I get halfway. Maybe you just switch off your channel in any case, so I should stop. But the point is transparency is the real evil in this case. The wrong kind of transparency. The wrong kind of scrutiny that comes with some of the right kind of scrutiny. So this is what we are facing, this constant, you know, the public is in the act, and they are completely now uh, removed, I would say, the sensible middle layer that was what we call politicians, that are meant to represent you and understand the context in which decisions are needed to make. And you, and I'm not talking about you exactly, I, I see some honest guys out there also. <laughs> you know, uh, but you, are, it's just a sad thing to look at. The more things go wrong, the more you want transparency, the more things will go wrong. We are really on a downward spiral, you know, as far as, as, uh, as this system is. So that was a long answer, but it is an important answer, because I happen to think this is our biggest threat to democracy, right there. This transparency, and it is the public that is craving more and more of it. Uh, well, then on a, uh, a little bit of a different note, uh, in my experience, the incentive systems used by firms are often not very good. Uh, for example, they might pay close attention to capital expenditure while ignoring operating expenditure. How could this be explained? I don't know. I, I don't know that they are doing that. That's why I can't explain. But I can say everything is very context dependent. It's not possible for me to give a general answer to something. I, I'm very reluctant to go in there and say you should do this and this and this and not understand the many features. Remember I said you, I need to know to start with what is your whole objective and the portfolio of tasks you are doing and what are you trying to achieve. You know, these are, it, it just requires, so it's like asking a, a doctor, you know, that, uh, that you know, I have, a 38 degree fever, what's a 39 degree, what, what should I do? That's all I'm telling you. I have a 30, you know, maybe he says aspirin 
or something like that. But beyond that, you want to diagnose the problem. So that's why I don't think one can answer. So, so let me try to interpret this uh, in some way. So, so usually when you see a bad contract design somewhere out there, whether a firm or a public sector, what do you think is the most common cause? Is it just bad design or maybe conflicts of interest for those who do the design or? I think there's a lot of, one should keep in mind that a lot of the designers don't have really good incentives themselves. So if you look at stock markets, for instance, and you, you look at the CEOs who are supposedly very bad, it's actually driven, that's another example, it's driven by, by you know, the fund managers who want certain returns, they want short-termism, they want, uh, and who is driving the fund managers? You guys, your pension money is driving it. So, you know, you are driving your, with your money, the fund managers are driving the CEO to do all things, ship things into China, whether that's good or bad, I don't want to take a stand, but you know, all of that comes from the money. And then, you know, they throw you guys out from the job and, and, and then you're upset. But it's actually a real big circle that you see. Uh, and, and every part of the chain, there can be the problem. So you, you need not always look at, you know, just the particular and said it's maybe coming from somebody else and there are actually a lot of papers written about this now. Uh, then a very big uh, question applies to firms as well as universities, any organization. What should salary differences be based on? So that's only, uh, the market determines salary differences. Finally, uh, this was a normal answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's go back to this technology side a little bit. Uh, so, digitalization and computer technology, what impact have they had on contracts or will have? Well, this is an interesting thing that, uh, so I take a, a very particular angle and I, had I had more time, you know, I would have explained. One of the things that I think really is in, happening right now is that people have a distraction. What's the main distraction for people today? It's not Charles River or, you know, some other beauty. It is the smartphone. As a matter of fact, it's not just a distraction. You can be, I can hire your employee as an employee and you are running two businesses from your smartphone without me being able to in any way control you. So remember this 100-year-old rule, 200-year-old rule that you work for me and nobody else and I can see it because you are sitting right in my office here. I don't know anymore whether you are running a lot of different companies and, and thinking about it. It's estimated 50%, up to 50% of the time, employees now spend watching, looking at some gadget, you know, the, the smartphone mainly, but others also. Now that's a huge reallocation of effort, you know this, to something that not clearly may not be very advantageous to the firm. They don't know, is it for the firm or not the firm, but 50% may explain why our productivity is going down, not up. Uh, then I have a question from uh, someone who maybe had a bad day, but uh, how do you see the role of education changing as artificial intelligence and automation render many of our professions useless? It's not, for, it, 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 it isn't really an a, a incentive problem, but ev everything, of course, at some level is about incentives. I don't have a good answer, but I tell you, I, I, I will give my answer for Europe. Europe needs to rethink its higher education. There is a, there is a better model out there, and they should just get on doing the implementing, Finland especially implementing the, the uh, what is Bologna treat, the Bologna model or something. But uh, I, I've written about this or, or spoken about it in public. But I, I think we really need to rethink uh, education, uh, both for technological reasons, which is, you know, the edX type programs, I think they are going to come. But I think also the structure of uh, the way we are doing things needs to change. No. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, after Donald Trump got elected as the next president of the United States, 
over 1 trillion US dollars has disappeared from different government bonds and other instruments like that. Are you um, concerned that we might be headed towards a sovereign debt crisis? Well, that's a little bit off the topic, but I, let me just say <laughs> briefly that uh, let's see what happens. You know, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think anybody knows the markets have re reacted in strange ways. In the best of circumstances, we will actually get us out of the rut, so to speak. Something has shaken up the system, we are off to a different equilibrium. It could also be a disastrous equilibrium. But no, I don't worry in the first instance about sovereign debt crisis in the U.S. Okay. Thanks. Not, that, not when it's close to 0% of interest rates. It's not going to happen immediately. Any burning questions? Actually, I was going to uh, abuse my privilege and ask okay. one question, <laughs> okay. so, uh, which is related to development of contract theory and universities in general. So, so one amazing fact when you start studying uh, microeconomics is that you realize that there's a big body of work having to do with questions of asymmetric information that was produced in one place uh, that's not a household name, that's Northwestern University in late 70s, early 80s. Already some Nobel Prizes have been given for it. This is one more, and I don't think it's the last one. What on earth happened at Northwestern University in late 70s, early 80s? I only gave one answer, which is people sitting in rooms without windows. <laughs> uh, you know, so that was a good study. It's true, by the way. Not only was my office without windows, the room we usually talked in had no windows either. It does have a coffee machine, but you know, so it drew people in, but that's where, that's where Milgram and, and, and Roberts and others were working on the back. We had huge blackboard. The answer is that, that you know, good people, uh, young, excited minds, you know, you don't need very many of those around. And then what Northwestern did right, they just let us be. They didn't, you know, try to direct us right or left or no, no incentives, you know, no financial incentives. It's just, Marco, do what you do. And by the way, I see the same thing at Alto University's economics department. I wrote you also about it and I wrote it. There's this excitement. Now it's empirical. We were all theoretical. But now it's empirical. You see the same at MIT, the empirical people. When I go to their seminars, I don't understand a whole lot, but I understand these people are excited. And you know, the way they argue with each other and so on. It is, I say, I feel really good about it. I feel good about Alto, I feel good about MIT, and, and uh, I am sure. But it's also a lesson that, that, you know, these were so unusual ideas. That when I went to Yale, I would say 90% of that department had no idea. I taught the first course on information economics at Yale with Milgram. They had no idea, and they were pretty arrogant, by the way. They didn't want to hire me because they, they, they thought I didn't really know what I was doing. And eventually, just like the people at Alstom, you know, the factory chiefs, they thought the headquarters doesn't know what they are doing. So I, I came to realize they were just so totally ignorant about this. So, you know, you can have pockets of excellent places just completely walking off in their own direction where something new happens, and that's when the opportunity comes. So that's my answer. And it's not the first time, by the way. It's not Kellogg, it was before that. It was Purdue, was a very big place. Carnegie Mellon was, you know, the Nobel Prize, Lucas Prescott, you know, uh, Williamson, that's Carnegie Mellon. You know, so these really transformative ideas tend to come up often in places that are not, you know, leading places. Okay, so thank you very much. So I, I guess we're done, so let's thank Bank for coming over. Thank you very much.